the lower limb in its basic structure is similar to the upper limb because both of them formerly, as in animals, were used for locomotion. Each limb has a girdle, hip girdle for lower limb or shoulder girdle for upper limb, by which it is attached to the axial skeleton. The girdle supports three main segments of the limb, a proximal thigh or arm, a middle leg or forearm and a distal foot or hand. The similarity between the two limbs is not only outward, but to a great extent it is also found in the bones, joints, muscles, vessels, nerves and lymphatics. However, with the evolution of erect or plantigrade posture in man, the two limbs despite their basic similarities have become specialized in different directions to meet the new functional needs. The emancipated upper limb is specialized for prehension and free mobility whereas the lower limb is specialized for support and locomotion. In general, the lower limbs attain stability at the cost of some mobility, and the upper limbs attain freedom of mobility at the cost of some stability. Thus the lower limbs are bulkier and stronger than the upper limbs. A few of the distinguishing features of the lower limbs are listed below. 1. During early stages of development, the lower limb buds rotate medially through 90 degrees, so that their preaxial or tibial border faces medially and the extensor surface forwards. The upper limb buds, on the other hand, rotate laterally through 90 degrees, so that their preaxial or radial border faces laterally and the extensor surface backwards. 2. The anti-gravity muscles in the lower limb are much better developed than in the upper limb because they have to lift the whole body up during attaining the erect posture and also in walking up the staircase. These muscles are the gluteus maximus, extensor of hip, the quadriceps femoris, extensor of knee and the gastrocnemius and soleus, plantar flexors of ankle at the back of leg. They have an extensive origin and a large, bulky, fleshy belly. 3. The distal end or insertion of the muscles of lower limb moves only when feet are off the ground, this is known as the action from above. But when feet are supporting the body weight, the muscles act in reverse from below, i.e. the proximal end or origin moves towards the distal end or insertion. This is typically seen while rising up from a sitting posture, and in going upstairs. Maintenance of posture in erect attitude, both at rest and in walking, running, etc. also involves the reverse action when the antagonist muscles must balance against each other. Reverse muscular actions are far less common in the upper limb. For the postaxial bone or fibula of the leg does not take part in the formation of knee joint. Patella or kneecap is a large sesamoid bone developed in the tendon of quadriceps femoris. It articulates with the lower end of femur anteriorly, and takes part in the formation of knee joint. 5. The foot in lower primates is a prehensal organ. The apes and monkeys can very well grasp the boughs with their feet. Their great toe can be opposed over the lesser toes. In man, however, the foot has changed from a grasping to a supporting organ. In fact, foot has undergone maximum change during evolution. The great toe comes in line with the other toes, loses its power of opposition, and is greatly enlarged to become the principal support of the body. The four lesser toes, with the loss of prehensile function, have become vestigial and reduced in size. The tarsal bones become large, strong, and wedge-shaped, which contribute to the stable support on one hand, and form the elastic arches of the foot on the other hand. The small and insignificant heel of the grasping primate foot becomes greatly enlarged and elongated to which is attached the tendocle canius that can lift the heel in walking. The bony alterations are associated with numerous ligamentous and muscular modifications which aim at the maintenance of the arches of foot. Six certain diseases, like varicose veins and Berger's disease, occur specifically in the lower limb. The developmental deformities of the foot like talipes equinovarus are more common than those of the hand. Related terms 1 The hip bone is made up of three elements, ilium, pubis is and ischium, which are fused at the acetabulum. Two hip bones form the hip girdle which articulates posteriorly with the sacrum at the sacroiliac joints. The bony pelvis includes the two hip bones, a sacrum and a coccyx. Hip joint is an articulation between the hip bone and femur. 2. The gluteal region, overlying the side and back of the pelvis, includes the hip and the buttock which are not sharply distinguished from each other. 
hip or coxa is the superolateral part of the gluteal region presented in a side view, while the buttock or rhyoeus is the inferomedial rounded bulge of the region presented in a back view. 3. The junction of thigh and anterior abdominal wall is indicated by the groove of groin or inguinal region. 4. Posteriorly is the lower part of the back of the thigh and the back of knee 5 call or sura is the soft, bulky posterior part of the leg. The bony prominences, one on each side of the ankle, are called the maliali. These are formed by the lower ends of tibia and fibula. 6. The look has an upper surface, called the dorsal surface, and a lower surface, called the sole or plantar surface. Sole is homologous with the palm of the hand. The line of gravity passes through cervical and lumbar vertebrae. In the lower limbs, it passes behind the hip joint and in front of knee and ankle joints. Introduction, various bones of the lower limb have been enumerated in the previous chapter. The bones are described one by one below. The description of each bone is given in two parts. The first part introduces the main features and the second part describes the muscular and ligamentous attachments. The hip bone, hip slash inominate bone is a large irregular bone. It is made up of three parts. These are the ilium, Latin loin, superiorly, the publus Latin genital area, antero inferiorly, and the ischium, Greek hip joint, posteroerd feriorly. The three parts are joined to each other at a cup shaped hollow, called the acetabulum, Latin vinegar cup. The pubis and ischium are separated by a large oval opening called the obturator foramen. The acetabulum articulates with the head of the femur to form the hip joint. The pubic parts of the two hip bones meet anteriorly to form the pubic symphysis. The two hip bones form the pelvic or hip girdle. The bony pelvis is formed by the two hip bones along with the sacrum and coccyx. Side determination, 1. The acetabulum is directed laterally. 1. The flat expanded ilium forms the upper part of the bone, that lies above the acetabulum. 2. The obturator foramen lies below the acetabulum. It is bounded anteriorly by the thin pubis, and posteriorly by the thick and strong ischium. Anatomical position, 1. The pubic symphysis and anterior superior iliac spine lie in the same coronal plane. The pelvic surface of the body of the pubis is directed backwards and upwards. 2. The symphyseal surface of the body of the pubis lies in the median plane. Ilium, the ilium or jerk forms the upper expanded plate-like part of the hip bone. Its lower part forms the upper two-fifths of the acetabulum. The ilium has the following, 1. An upper end which is called the iliac crest. 2. A lower end which is smaller, and is fused with the pubis and the ischium at the acetabulum. The ilium forms the upper two-fifths of the acetabulum. 3 3 borders anterior, posterior, and medial. 4 3 surfaces gluteal surface, iliac surface or iliac fossa, and a sacropelvic surface. Iliac crest, the iliac crest is a broad convex ridge forming the upper end of the ilium. It can be felt in the living at the lower limit of the flank. Confugres, vertically it is convex upwards, antero posteriorly, it is concave inwards in front and concave outwards behind the highest point of the iliac, crest is situated a little behind the midpoint of the crest. It lies at the level of the interval between the spines of vertebrae L3 and L4. Ends, the anterior end of the iliac crest is called the anterior superior iliac spine, ASIS. This is a prominent landmark that is easily felt in the living. The posterior end of the crest is called the posterior superior iliac spine. Its position on the surface of the body is marked by a dimple 5 cm lateral of the second sacral spine, S2. Morphological divisions, morphologically, the iliac crest is divided into a long ventral segment and a short dorsal segment. The ventral segment forms more than the anterior two-thirds of the crest. It has an outer lip, an inner lip, and an intermediate area. The tubercle of the iliac crest is an elevation that lies on the outer lip about 5 cm behind the anterior superior iliac spine. The dorsal segment forms less than the posterior one-third of the crest. It has a lateral and a medial slope separated by a ridge. Anterior border of lium, 
anterior border starts at the anterior superior iliac spine and runs downwards to the acetabulum. The upper part of the border presents a notch, while its lower part shows an elevated area called the anterior inferior iliac spine. The lower half of this spine is large, triangular, and rough. Posterior border of Lyme, posterior border extends from the posterior superior iliac spine to the upper end of the posterior border of the ischium. A few centimeters below the posterior superior iliac spine it presents another prominence called the posterior inferior iliac spine. Still J lower down the posterior border is marked by a large deep notch called the greater sciatic notch. Medial border, medial border extends on the inner or pelvic surface of the ilium from the iliac crest to the iliopubic eminence. It separates the iliac fossa from the sacropelvic surface. Its lower rounded part forms the iliac parts of the arcuate line or inlet of pelvis. Gluteal surface, gluteal surface is the outer surface of the ilium, which is convex in front and concave behind, like the iliac crest. It is divided into four areas by three gluteal lines. The posterior gyphoi line, the shortest, begins 5 cm in front of the posterior superior iliac spine, and runs downwards to end at upper part of greater sciatic notch. The anterior gluteal line, the longest, begins about 4 cm behind the anterior superior iliac spine, runs backwards and then downwards to end at the middle of the upper border of the greater sciatic notch. The inferior gluteal line, the most ill-defined, begins a little above and behind the anterior inferior spine, runs backwards and downwards to end near the apex of the greater sciatic notch. Iliac fossa, iliac fossa is the large concave area on the inner surface of the ilium, situated in front of its medial border. It forms the lateral wall of the false pelvis. Sacropelvic surface, sacropelvic surface is the uneven area on the inner surface of the ilium, situated behind its medial border. It is subdivided into three parts, the iliac tuberosity, the auricular surface and the pelvic surface. The iliac tuberosity, is the upper, large, roughened area, lying just below the dorsal segment of the iliac crest. It is raised in the middle and depressed both above and below. The auricular surface is articular but pitted. It lies antero-inferior to the iliac tuberosity. It articulates with the sacrum to form the sacroiliac joint. The pelvic surface is smooth and lies antero-inferior to the auricular surface. It forms a part of the lateral wall of the true pelvis. Along the upper border of the greater sciatic notch, this surface is marked by the pre-auricular surface. This sulcus is deeper in females than in males. Attachments on the lium, one the anterior superior iliac spine gives attachment to the lateral end of the inguinal ligament. It also gives origin to the sarforophilus muscle, the origin extends onto the upper half of the notch below the spine. To the outer lip of the iliac crest provides, attachment to the slash asiolata in its whole extent. Origin to the tensor fasciae lati in front of the tubercle. Insertion to the external obliqual muscle in its anterior two-thirds. Origin to the latissimus dorsi just behind the highest point of the crest. The tubercle of the crest gives attachment to the iliotibial tract. 3. The inner of the lip of the iliac crest provides, origin to the transoursus abdominis in its anterior two-thirds. 1. Attachment to the fascia transversalis. 2. Fascia iliaca in its anterior two-thirds, deep to the attachment of the transversus abdominis. 3. Origin to the quadratus lumborum in its posterior one-third. Attachment to the thoracolumbar fascia around the attachment of the quadratus lumborum. 3. The intermediate area of the iliac crest gives origin to the internal oblique muscle in its anterior two-thirds. 4. The attachments on the dorsal segment of the iliac crest are as follows. The lateral slope gives origin to the gluteus maximus. The medial slope gives origin to the elector spiny. The iterosio floes and dorsal sacroiliac ligaments are attached to the medial margin deep to the attachment of the elector spiny. 5. The upper half of the anterior inferior iliac spine gives origin to the straight heat of the recchis femoris. The rough lower part of this spine gives attachment to the iliofemoral ligament. 5. The posterior border of the ilium provides, 
a attachment to upper fibers of RHE sacrophyll herox ligament above the greater sciatic notch. Origin to few fibers of the piriformis from upper margin of the greater sciatic notch. The attachments on gluteal surface EXE as follows. The area behind the posterior gluteal line gives origin to upper fibers of the gluteus maximus. The gluteus medius arises from the area between the anterior and posterior gluteal lines. The glufex minimus arises from the area between the anterior and inferior gluteal lines. Below the inferior gluteal line, the rejected head of the rectus femoris arises from the groove above the acetabulum. The copsular ligament of phi hip joint is attached along the margin of acetabulum. The iliac fossa gives origin to the iliacus from its upper two-thirds. The lower groove part of the fossa is covered by the iliac bursa. 6. The iliac tubercid Y provides attachment to the interosseous sacroiliac ligament in its greater part. The dorsal sacroiliac ligament posteriorly. The iliolumbar argument superiorly. 7. The convex margin of the auricular surface gives attachment to central sacroiliac ligament. 8. The attachments on the pelvic surface are as follows. The preauricular sulcus provides attachment to the lower fibers of the ventral sacroiliac ligament. The part of the pelvic surface lateral to the preauricular sulcus gives origin to a few fibers of the piriformis. The rest of the pelvic surface gives origin to the upper half of the obturator infernos. Pubis, it forms the antero-inferior part of the hip bone and the anterior one-fifth of the acetabulum, forms the anterior boundary of the obturator foramen. It has, a body anteriorly. A superior ramus superolaterally. Anfiorfl 0 f races inferolaterally. Body of pubis, this is flattened from before backwards, and has, 1 a superior border called the pubic crest. 2 a pubic tubercle at the lateral end of the pubic crest. 3 3 surfaces, viz. Anterior, posterior, and medial. The pubic tubercle is the lateral end of the pubic crest, forming an important landmark. The anterior surface is directed downwards, forwards, and slightly laterally. It is rough superomedially and smooth elsewhere. The posferior is smooth. It is directed upwards and backwards. It forms the anterior wall of the true pelvis, and is related to the urinary bladder. The medial or symphyseal surface articulates with the opposite pubis to form the pubic symphysis. Superior romus, it extends from the body of the pubis to the acetabulum, above the obturator foramen. It has three borders and three surfaces. The superior border is called the pectineal line or pectin puhis. It is a sharp crest extending from just behind the pubic tubercle to the posterior part of the iliopubic eminence. With the pubic crest it forms the pubic part of the arcuate line. The anterior border is called the obturator crest. The border is a rounded ridge, extending from the pubic tubercle to the acetabular notch. The inferior border is sharp and forms the upper margin of the obturator foramen. The pectineal surface is a triangular area between the anterior and superior borders, extending from the pubic tubercle to the iliopubic eminence. The pelvic striller lies between the superior and inferior borders. It is smooth and is continuous with the pelvic surface of the body of the pubis. The obturator surface lies between the anterior and inferior borders. It presents the obturator groove. Inferior romus, it extends from the body of the pubis to the ramus of the ischium, medial to the obturator foramen. It unites with the ramus O1 the ischium to form the conjoined ischiopubic rami. For convenience of description, the conjoined rami will be considered together at the end. Attachments and relations of the pubis, 1. The pubic tubercle provides attachment to the medial end of the inguinal ligament and to ascending loops of the cremaster muscle. In males, the tubercle is crossed by the spermatic cord. 2. The medial part of the pubic crest is crossed by the medial head of the rectus abdominis. The lateral part O1 the crest gives origin to the lateral head of the rectus abdominis, and to the pyramid alice. 3. The anterior surface of the body of the pubis provides, attachment to the anterior pubic ligament medially. Origin to the adductor forges in the angle between the crest and the symphysis. Origin to the gracilis, 
from the margin of symphysis, and from the inferior ramus. Origin to the adductor rearus lateral to the origin of the gracilis. Origin to the obturator externus near the margin of the obturator foramen. The posterior surface of the body of the pubis provides, origin to the arafor ani from its middle part. Origin to the obturator internus laterally. Attachment to the puboprostatic ligaments medial to the attachment of the levator ani. The pectineal line provides attachment to, 1 the CO and ointment tendon at the medial end. 2 the lacunar ligament at the medial end, in front of the attachment of the CO and ointment tendon. 3 the pectineal ligament of Cooper along the whole length of the line lateral to the attachment of the lacunar ligament for the pectineus muscle which arises from the whole length of the line. 5 the fascius covering the pectineus. 6 the psoas minor, which is inserted here when present. Dot the upper part of the pectineal surface gives origin to the pectineus. Dot the pelvic surface is crossed by the ductus deferens in males, and the round ligament of the uterus in females. Dot the obturator groove transmits the obturator vessels and nerve. Ischium, the ischium forms the postero-inferior part of the hip bone, and the adjoining two filths of the acetabulum. It forms the posterior boundary of the obturator foramen. The ischium has a body and a ramus. Body of the ischium, this is a thick and massive mass of bone that lies below and behind the acetabulum. It has two ends upper and lower. Three borders anterior, posterior, and lateral, three surfaces femoral, dorsal, and pelvic two ends, one the upper end forms the posteroinferior two filths of the acetabulum. The ischium, ilium, and pubis fuse with each other in the acetabulum. To the lower end forms the ischial tuberosity. It gives off the ramus of the ischium which forms an acute angle with the body. 3. Border, L. The anterior border forms the posterior margin of the obturator foramen. 2. The posterior border is continuous above with the posterior border of the ilium. Below, it ends at the upper end of the ischial tuberosity. It also forms part of the lower border O1 the greater sciatic notch. Below the notch the posterior margin shows a projection called the ischial spitter. Below the spine the posterior border shows a concavity called the lesser sciatic notch. 3. The lateral border forms the lateral margin of the ischial tuberosity, except at the upper end where it is rounded. 3. Surfaces, 1. The femoral strurus lies between the anterior and lateral borders. 2. The dorsal surface is continuous above with the gluteal surface of the ilium. From above downwards it presents a convex surface adjoining the acetabulum, a wide shallow groove, and the upper part of the ischial tuberosity. The ischial tuberosity is divided by a transverse ridge into an upper and a lower area. The upper area is subdivided by an oblique ridge into a superolateral area and an iralromedial area. The lower area is subdivided by a longitudinal ridge into outer and inner area. The pelvic surface is smooth and forms part of the lateral wall of the true pelvis conjoined ischiopubic rami, the inferior ramus of the pubis unites with the ramus of the ischium on the medial side of the obturator foramen. The site of union may be marked by a localized thickening. The conjoined rami have, 1-2 borders up and lower. 2 The upper border forms part of the margin of the obturator foramen. The lower border forms the pubic arch along with the corresponding border of the bone of the opposite side. 2. Surface, the inner surface is convex and smooth. It is divided into three areas, upper, middle and lower, by two ridges. The outer surface is for the attachment of muscles attachments and relations of the ischium, one the ischial spine provides, attachment to the sacrospinous ligament along its margins. Origin for the posterior fibers of the levator ERM from its pelvic surface. Its dorsal surface is crossed by pudendal nerve the internal pudendal vessels and by the nerve to the obturator intimus. 2. The lesser sciatic notch is occupied by the tendon of the obturator internus. There is a bursa deep to the tendon. The notch is lined by hyaline cartilage. The upper and lower margins of the notch give origin to the superior and inferior gemelli respectively. Gemellus is derived from Gemini, which means twin. Gemini is a sun sign. 3. The femoral surface of the ischium give orange to, the obturator externus along the margin of the obturator foramen. 
the Quadratus lemuris along the lateral border of the upper part of the Ischial tuber city. For the dorsal shuriace of the ischium has the following relationships. The upper convex area is related to the piriformis, the sciatic nerve, and the nerve to the quadratus femoris. 5. The attachments on the ischial tuber city are as follows, the superolateral area give origin to the semimembranosus. The inferomedial area to the semitendinosus and the long head of the hyceps femoris. The outer lower area to the adductor magritus. The inner lower area is covered with fibrofatty tissue which supports body weight in the sitting position. The sharp medial margin of the tuber city gives attachment to the sacrotuberous ligament. The lateral border of the ischial tuber city provides attachment to the ischiofemoral ligament, just below the acetabulum. 6. The greater part of the pelvic surface of the ischium gives origin to the obturator infernos. The lower end of this surface forms part of the lateral wall of the ischioanal fossa. The attachments on the conjoined ischiopubic rami are as follows, the upper border gives attachment to the obturator membrane. The lower border provides attachment to the gesiotata, and to the membranous layer of superficial fascia or colles ensia of the perineum. The muscles taking origin from the outer surface are, the obturator externus, near the obturator margin of both rami. The adductor brevis, chiefly from the pubic ramus. The gracilis, chiefly from the pubic ramus. The adductor magnus, chiefly from the ischial ramus. The attachments on the inner surface are as follows, the perineal membrane is attached to the lower ridge. The upper area gives origin to the obturator internus. The middle area gives origin to the deep transversus perinea, and is related to the dorsal nerve of the penis, and to the internal pudendal vessels. The lower area provides attachment to cruce penis, and gives origin to the ischiocavenosus and to superficial transversus perinea. Acetabulum, it is a deep cup-shaped hemispherical cavity on the lateral aspect of the hip bone, about its center. It is directed laterally, downwards, and forwards. The margin of the acetabulum is deficient inferiorly, this deficiency is called the acetabular notch. It is bridged by the transverse ligament. The non-articular roughened floor is called the acetabular fossa. It contains a mass of fat which is lined by synovial membrane. A horseshoe-shaped articular surface or lunate surface is seen on the anterior, superior, and posterior parts of the acetabulum. It is lined with hyaline cartilage, and articulates with the head of the femur to form the hip joint. The fibrocartilaginous acetabular labrum is attached to the margins of the acetabulum, it deepens the acetabular cavity. Obturator foramen, this is a large gap in the hip bone, situated antero-inferior to acetabulum, between the pubis and the ischium. It is large and oval in males, and small and triangular in females. It is closed by the obturator membrane which is attached to its margins, except at the obturator groove where the obturator vessels and nerve pass out of the pelvis. The hip bone ossifies in cartilage from three primary centers and five secondary centers. The primary centers appear, one for the ilium during the second month of intrauterine life, one for the ischium during the fourth month, and one for the pubis during the fifth month. At birth the hip bone is ossified except for three cartilaginous parts. These three are, the iliac crest. A Y-shaped cartilage separating the ilium, ischium, and pubis. A strip along the inferior margin of the bone including the ischial tuber city. The ischiopubic rami fuse with each other at 7 to 8 years of age. The secondary centers appear at puberty, two for the iliac crest, two for the Y-shaped cartilage of the acetabulum and one for the ischial tuber city. Ossification in the acetabulum is complete at 16-17 years, and the rest of the bone is ossified by 20-25 years. The anterior superior iliac spine, pubic tubercle, and crest and the symphyseal surface may have separate secondary centers of ossification. Iliac crest is used for taking bone marrow biopsy in cases of anemia or leukemia. Weaver's bottom person sitting for a long period of time may get inflammation of their ischial tuber city bursa. The femur, Latin thigh, or thigh bone is the longest and the strongest bone of the body. Like any other typical bone it has two ends upper and lower, and a shaft. 
side determination, one the upper end bears a rounded head whereas the lower end is widely expanded to form two large condyles. Two the head is directored medially. The cylindrical shaft is convex forwards. Anatomical position, one the head is directed medially upwards and slightly forwards. Two the shaft is directed obliquely downwards and medially so that the lower surfaces of two condyles of femur lie in the same horizontal plane. Features, upper two ends. The upper end of the femur includes the head, the neck, the greater trochanter the lesser trochanter, the intertrochanteric line, and the intertrochanteric crest. These are described as follows. Head, one the head forms more than half a sphere, and is directed medially, upwards, and slightly forwards. It articulates with the acetabulum to form the hip joint. A roughened pit is situated just below and behind the center of the head. This pit is called the fovea. Neck, it connects the head with th shaft and about 3.7 cm long the neck has two borders and two surfaces. The upper border, concave and horizontal, meets the shaft at the greater trochanter. The lower border, straight and oblique, meets the shaft near the lesser trochanter. The anterior surface is flat. It meets the shaft at the intertrochanteric line. It is entirely intracapsular. The articular cartilage of the head may extend to the surface. The posterior surface is convex from above downwards and concave from side to side. It meets the shaft at the intertrochanteric crest. Only a little more than its medial half is intracapsular. The posterior surface is crossed by a horizontal groove for the tendon of the obturator externus to be inserted into the trochanteric fossa. The neck makes an angle with the shaft. The angle is about 125 degrees in adults. It is less in females due to their wider pelvis. The angle facilitates movements of the hip joint. It is strengthened by a thickening of bone called the calcar femoral present along its concavity. Trochanter shaft angle is about 8 degrees in adults. It is an important radiological parameter which provides the idea of direction of medullary canal and its alignment with the greater trochanter. The angle of femoral torsion or angle of antiversion is formed between the transverse axes of the upper and lower ends of the femur. It is about 15 degrees. Blood supply. The intracapsular part of the neck is supplied by the retinacular arteries derived chiefly from the trochanteric anastomosis. The vessels produce longitudinal grooves and foramina directed towards the head, mainly on the anterior and posterosuperior surfaces. The extracapsular part of the neck is supplied by the ascending branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery. Greater trochanter, one this is large quadrangular prominence located at the upper part of the junction of neck with the shaft. The upper border of the trochanter lies at the level of the center of the head. 2. The greater trochanter has an upper border with an apex, and three surfaces, anterior, medial and lateral. The apex is the interned posterior part of the posterior border. The anterior surface is rough in its lateral part. The medial surface presents a rough impression above, and a deep trochanteric fossa below. The lateral surface is crossed by an oblique ridge directed downwards and forwards. Lesser trochanter, it is a conical eminence directed medially and backwards from the junction of the postero-inferior part of the neck with the shaft. Under trochanteric leader it marks the junction of the anterior surface of the neck with the shaft of the femur. It is a prominent roughened ridge which begins above, at the anterosuperior angle of the greater trochanter as a tubercle, and is continuous below with the spiral line in front of the lesser trochanter. The spiral line winds round the shaft below the lesser trochanter to reach the posterior surface of the shaft. In trochanteric crest, it marks the junction of the posterior surface of the neck with the shaft of the femur. It is a smooth rounded ridge, which begins above at the posterosuperior angle of the greater trochanter and ends at the lesser trochanter. The rounded elevation, a little above its middle, is called the quadrate tubercle. Shaft, the shaft is more or less cylindrical. It is narrowest in the middle, and is more expanded inferiorly than superiorly. It is convex forwards and is directed obliquely downwards and medially, because the upper ends of two femora are separated by the width of the pelvis, and their lower ends are close together. 
In the middle one third, the shaft has three borders, medial, lateral and posterior and three surfaces, anterior, medial and lateral. The medial and lateral borders are rounded and ill-defined, but the posterior border is in the form of a broad roughened ridge, called the linea aspira. The linea aspira has distinct medial and lateral lips. The medial and lateral surfaces are directed more backwards than towards the sides. In the upper one-third of the shaft, the two lips of the linea aspira diverge to enclose an additional posterior surface. Thus this part has, 1-4 borders medial, lateral, spiral line and the lateral lip of the gluteal tuberosity 2-4 surfaces anterior, medial, lateral, and posterior. The gluteal tuberosity is a broad roughened ridge on the lateral part of the posterior surface. In the lower one-third of the shaft also, the two lips of the linea aspira diverge as supracondylar lines to enclose an additional, popliteal surface. Thus, this part of the shaft has, 1-4 borders medial, lateral, medial supracondylar line and lateral supracondylar line. Four surfaces anterior, medial, lateral one and popliteal. The medial border and medial supracondylar line meet irtferiorly to obliterate the medial surface. Lower end, the lower end of the femur is widely expanded to form two large condyles, one medial and one lateral. Anteriorly, the two condyles are united and are in line with the front of the shaft. Posteriorly, they are separated by a deep gap, termed the intercondylar fossa or intercondylar notch, and project backwards much beyond the plane of the popliteal surface. Articular surface. The two condyles are partially covered by a large articular surface which is divisible into patellar and tibial parts. The patellar surface cover the anterior surfaces of both condyles, and extends more on the lateral condyle than on the medial. Between the two condominium meals the surface is grooved vertically. It is separated from the tibial surfaces by two faint grooves. The tibial surfaces cover the inferior and posterior surfaces of the two condyles, and merge anteriorly with the patellar surface. The part of the dot surface over the lateral condyle is short and straight anteroposteriorly. The part over the medial condyle is one T-enger and is cuoled with its CONV exity direct tackle medially. Lateral condyle, the lateral condyle is flat laterally, and is more in line with the shaft. It, therefore, takes greater part in the transmission of body weight to the tibia. Though it is less prominent than the medial condyle, it is stouter and stronger. The lateral aspect presents the following. 1A prominence called the lateral epicondyle. 2 The popliteal groove which lies just below the epicondyle. It has a deeper anterior part and a shallower posterior part. 3. A muscular impress tori postero superior to the epicondyle. Medial condyle, this condyle is convex medially. The most prominent point gone it is called the medial epicondyle. Postero superior to the epicondyle there is a projection, the adductor tubercle. This tubercle is an important landmark. The epiphyseal line for the lower end of the femur passes through it. Intercondylar fossa or intercondylar notch. This notch separates the lower and posterior parts of the two condyles. It is limited anteriorly by the patellar articular surface, and posteriorly by the intercondylar line which separates the notch from the popliteal surface. Attachments on the femur L. The fovea on the head of the femur provides attachment to the ligament of the head of femur or round ligament, or ligamentum teres slash femoris. Two the following are attached to the greater trochanter. The piriformis is inserted into the apex. Th gluteal minimus is inserted into the rough lateral part of the anterior surface. The obturator infernos and the two gemelli are inserted into the upper rough impression on medial surface. The obturat or extern FLS is inserted into the trochanteric fossa. The gluteus medius is inserted into the ridge on the lateral surface. The trochanteric bursa of the gluteus maximus lies behind the ridge. 3. The attachment on the lesser trochanter are as follow, the psoas, Greek loin, major is inserted on the apex and medial part of the rough anterior surface. The iliacus is inserted on the anterior surface of the base of the trochanter and on the area below it. 
The smooth posterior surface of the lesser trochanter is covered by a bursa that lies deep to the upper horizontal fibers of the adductor magnus. For the intratrochoneric line provides, a attachment to Anter's bar ligament of the hip joint. Attachment to the upper band of the iliofemoral ligament in its upper part. Attachment to the lower band of iliofemoral ligament in its lower part. Origin to the highest fibers of the cast's lateral from the upper end. Origin to the highest fibers of the gallus metisalis maxis. Dot the lower end of the line. The quadrate tubercle receives the insertion of the quadrifus femoris. For the attachments on the shaft are as follows, 1 the medial and popliteal surfaces are bare, except for a little extension of the origin of the medial head of the gastrocnemius to the medial part of popliteal surface. 2. The vastus intermedius arises from the upper three-fourths of the anterior and lateral surfaces. 3. The articula genu arises just below the vastus intermedius. 4. The lower 5 cm of the anterior surface are related to sperpofellar bursa. 5. Popliteal surface just above the medial condyle. 4. The attachment on the lateral condyle R, the fibular collateral ligament of the knee joint is attached to the lateral epicondyle. The popliteus arises from the deep anterior part of the popliteal groove. When the knee is flexed the tendon of this muscle lies in the shallow posterior part of the groove. The muscular impression near the lateral epicondyle gives origin to the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. The attachment on the medial condyle R, one tibial collateral ligament. The adductor tubercle receives the insertion of the hamstring part or the ischial head of the adductor magnus. The attachment on the inretcondylar notch are as follows, the anterior cruciate oneigament is attached to the posterior part of the medial surface of the lateral condyle, on a smooth impression. The posterior cruciate ligament is attached to the anterior part of the lateral surface of medial condyle, on a smooth impression. The intercondylar line provides attachment to the capsular ligament and laterally to the oblique popliteal ligament. The infrapatellar sonorius slash fold is attached to the anterior border of the intercondylar fossa. Nutrient artery to phe femur, this is derived from the second perforating artery, branch of profunda femoris artery. The nutrient foramen is located on the medial side of the linea aspira, and is directed upwards. Structure, the angles and curvatures of the femur are strengthened on their concave sides by bony buttresses. The concavity of the neck shaft angle is strengthened by a thickened buttress of compact bone, known as the calcar femoral. Similarly, the linea aspira is also supported by another buttress. This mechanism helps in resisting stresses including that of body weight. Ossification The femur ossifies from one primary and four secondary centers. The primary center for the shaft appears in the seventh week of intrauterine life. The secondary centers appear, one for the lower end at the end of the ninth month of intrauterine life, one for the head during the first six months of life, one for the greater trochanter during the fourth year, and one for the lesser trochanter during the twelfth year. There are three epiphyses at the upper end and one epiphysis at the lower end. The upper epiphyses, lesser trochanter, greater trochanter, and head, in that order, fuse with the shaft at about 18 years. The lower epiphysis fuses by the 20th year. The following points are noteworthy. The neck represents the upper end of the shaft because it ossifies from the primary center. Ossification of the lower end of the femur is of medical legal importance. Presence of its center in a newly born child found dead indicates that the child was viable, i.e. it was capable of independent existence. The lower end of the femur is the growing end. The lower epiphyseal line passes through the adductor tubercle. The epiphyseal line of the head coincides with the articular margins, except superiorly where a part of the non-articular area is included in the epiphysis for passage of blood vessels to the head. In addition, the plane of this epiphysis changes with age from an oblique to a more vertical one. Tripping over minor obstructions or other accidents causing forced medial rotation of the thigh and leg during the fall results in, the fracture of the shaft of femur in persons below the age of 16 years. Bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus between the ages of 14 and 40 years. Potts, British Surgeon 171388, fracture of the leg between the ages of 42 and 60 years. 
defracture of neck of the femur over the age of 60 years. This is common in females due to osteoporosis and degenerate lawn of calcar femoral. The head of femur is partly supplied by a branch of obturator artery along the ligamentum teres. Main arterial supply is from retinacular arteries, branches of medial femoral circumflex artery. These arteries get injured in intracapsular fracture of neck of femur, leading to ovascular necrosis of the head. In such cases hip joint need to be replaced. The center of ossification in lower end of femur and even in upper end of tibia seen by x-ray is used as a medical legal evidence to prove that the newborn, found dead, was nearly full term and was viable. In fracture of upper third of shaft of femur, proximal segment is flexed by iliopsoas, laterally rotated by muscles attached to greater trochanter. Distal segment is pulled upwards by hamstrings and laterally rotated by adductor muscles in normal knee, the obliquity of the line of quadriceps muscle and its insertion into the tibia, results in an angle called Q angle. It is normally 15 to 20 degrees. If the angle is increased, there may be lateral subluxation of the patella, the patella. The patella, Latin small plate, is the largest sesamoid bone in the body, developed in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. It is situated in front of the lower end of the femur about 1 cm above the knee joint. Side determination, 1 The patella is triangular in shape with its apex directed downwards. The apex is non-articular posteriorly. The anterior surface is rough and monarticular. The upper three-fourths of the posterior surface are smooth and articular. The posterior articular surface is divided by a vertical ridge into a larger lateral and a smaller medial areas. The bone laid on a table rests on the broad lateral articular area and determines the side of the bone. Features, the patella has an apex, three borders, superior, lateral and medial, and two surfaces, anterior and posterior. The apex directed downwards, is rough and vertically ridged. It is covered by an expansion from the tendon of the rectus femoris, and is separated from the skin by the prepatellar bursa. The posterior surface is articular in its upper three fouths and monarticular in its lower one fourth. The articular area is divided by a vertical ridge into a larger lateral and smaller medial portion. Another vertical ridge separates a medial strip from the medial portion. This strip articulates with a reciprocal strip on the medial side of the intercondylar notch of the femur during fufflo flexion. The rest of the medial portion and the lateral portion of the articular surface are divided by two transverse lines into three pairs of facets. During different phases of movements of the knee, different portions of the patella articulate with the femur. The lower pair of articular facets articulates during extension, middle pair during beginning of flexion, upper pair during mid-flexion, and the medial strip during full flexion of the knee. Attachments on the patella, the superior border or base provides insertion to the rectus femoris in front and to the vastus intermedius behind. The lateral border provides insertion to vastus lateralis in its upper one-third or half. The medial border provides insertion to the vastus medialis in its upper two-thirds. The non-articular area on the posterior surface provides attachment to the ligamentum patelli below, and is related intrapatellar pad of fat above. The patella ossifies from several centers which appear during 3 to 6 years of age. Fusion is complete at puberty. One or two centers at the superolateral angle of the patella may form separate pieces of bone. Such a patella is known as bipartite or tripartite patella. The condition is bilateral and symmetrical. Fracture of the patella should be differentiated from a bipartite or a tripartite patella. The patella has a natural tendency to dislocate outwards because of the outward angulation between the long axes of the thigh and leg. This is prevented by, bony factor, the lateral edge of the patellar articular surface of the femur is deeper than the medial edge. Vascular factor, Insertion of the vastus medialis on the medial border of patella extends lower than that of vastus lateralis on the lateral border. Vastus medialis is first to degenerate and last to recover in diseases of the knee joint. Facial factor, medial and lateral patellar retinacula are extensions of vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. These strengthen the capsule. 
these three are components of the extensor apparatus of knee joint. During sudden severe contraction of quadriceps, the tibial tuberosity may get avulsed. The tibial tuberosity ossifies as a downward protrusion of upper end. Patella may get fractured. Quadriceps femoris muscle is inserted into patella, from where ligamentum patellae arises, which ends into the tibial tuberosity. Bursitis occurs in prepatellar and subcutaneous infrapatellar bursa. The tibia, Latin shin home, is the medial and larger bone of the leg. It is homologous with the radius of the upper limb. Side determination the upper end is much larger than the lower end. 1. The medial side of the lower end projects downwards beyond the rest of the bone. The projection is called the medial malleolus. 2. The anterior border of the shaft is most prominent and crest-like. It is sinuously curved and terminates below at the anterior border of the medial malleolus. Features, the tibia has an upper end, a shaft, and a lower end. Upper end, the upper end of the tibia is markedly expanded from side to side, to form two large condyles which overhang the posterior surface of the shaft. The upper end includes, a medial condyle, a lateral condyle, an intercondylar area, a tuberosity. Medial condyle is larger than the lateral condyle. Its superior surface articulates with the medial condyle of the femur. The articular surface is oval and its long axis is anteroposterior. The central part of the surface is slightly concave and comes into direct contact with the femoral condyle. The peripheral part is flat and is separated from the femoral condyle by the medial meniscus. The lateral margin of the articular surface is raised to cover the medial intercondylar tubercle. The posterior surface of the medial condyle has a groove. The anterior and medial surfaces are marked by numerous vascular foramina. The lateral condyle overhangs the shaft more than the medial condyle. The superior surface of the condyle articulates with the lateral condyle of the femur. The articular surface is nearly circular. As in the case of the medial condyle, the central part is slightly concave and comes in direct contact with the femur, but the peripheral part is flat and is separated from the femur by the lateral meniscus. The articular surface has a raised medial margin which covers the lateral intercondylar tubercle. The postero-inferior aspect of the lateral condyle articulates with the fibula. The fibular facet is flat, circular, and is directed downwards, backwards and laterally. Superomedial to the fibular facet, the posterior surface of the condyle is marked by a groove. The anterior aspect of the condyle bears a flattened impression. Intercondylar area Intercondylar area is the roughened area on the superior surface, between the articular surfaces of the two condyles. The area is narrowest in its middle part. This part is elevated to form the intercondylar eminence which is flanked by the medial and lateral intercondylar tubercles. Tuberosity of the tibia, tuberosity of the tibia is a prominence located on the anterior aspect of the upper end of the tibia. It forms the anterior limits of the intercondylar area. Inferiorly it is continuous with the anterior border of the shaft. The tuberosity is divided into an upper smooth area and a lower rough area. The epiphyseal line for the upper end of the tibia passes through the junction of these two parts. Shaft, the shaft of the tibia is prismoid in shape. It has three borders, anterior, medial and interosseous, and three surfaces, lateral, medial and posterior. The anterior border is sharp and S-shaped being convex medially in the upper part and convex laterally in the lower part. It extends from the tibial tuberosity above to the anterior border of the medial malleolus below. It is subcutaneous and forms the shin. The medial border is rounded. It extends from the medial condyle, above, to the posterior border of the medial malleolus, below. The interosseous or lateral border extends from the lateral condyle a little below and in front of the fibular facet, to the anterior border of the fibular notch. Surface, the lateral surface lies between the anterior and interosseous borders. In its upper three-fourths, it is concave and is directed laterally, and in its lower one-fourth it is directed forwards. The medial surface lies between the anterior and medial borders. It is broad and most of it is subcutaneous. 
the posterior surface lies between the medial and interosseous borders. It is widest in its upper part. This part is crossed obliquely by a rough ridge called the soleal line. The soleal line begins just behind the fibular facet, runs downwards and medially, and terminates by joining the medial border at the junction of its upper and middle thirds. Above the soleal line, the posterior surface is in the form of a triangular area. The area below the soleal line is elongated. It is divided into medial and lateral parts by a vertical ridge. A rifle free knee foramen is situated near the upper end of this ridge. It is directed downwards and transmits the nutrient artery which is a branch of the posterior tibial artery. Lower end, the lower end of the tibia is slightly expanded. It has five surfaces. Medially, it is prolonged downwards as the medial malleolus. The anterior surface of the lower end has an upper smooth part, and a lower rough and grooved part. The medial surface is subcutaneous and is continuous with the medial surface of the medial malleolus. The lateral surface of the lower end presents a triangular fibular notch to which the lower end of the fibula is attached. The upper part of the notch is rough. The lower part is smooth and may be covered with hyaline cartilage. The irifereter surface of the lower end is articular. It articulates with the superior trochlear surface of the talus and thus takes part in forming the ankle joint. Medially the articular surface extends onto the medial malleolus. Posterior surface is smaller. The medial malleolus is a short but strong process which projects downwards from the medial surface of the lower end of the tibia. It forms a subcutaneous prominence on the medial side of the ankle. Attachments on the tibia, figures 2.26 to 2.28 show the attachments on the tibia. Attachment medial condyle. 1. The semimembranosus is inserted into the groove on the posterior surface. 2. The capsular ligament of the knee joint is attached to the upper border, which also gives attachment to the deeper fibers of the tibial collateral ligament. 3. The medial patellar retinaculum is attached to the anterior surface. Attachment on the lateral condyle, 1. The iliotibial tract is attached to the flattened impression on the anterior surface. 2. The copsular ligament of the superior tibia fibular joint is attached around the margins of the fibular facet. 3. The groove on the posterior surface of the lateral condyle is occupied by the tendon of the popliteus with a bursa intervening. Attachments on the intercondylar area. The following are attached from before backwards. 1. The anterior horn of the medial menus reflow st Greek small moon, just in front of the medial articular surface. The anterior cruciate ligament on a smooth area just behind the previous attachment. The anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, to the front of the intercondylar eminence, and lateral to the anterior cruciate ligament. The posterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the posterior slope of the intercondylar eminine. The posterior horn of the medial meniscus, to the depression behind the base of the medial intercondylar tubercle. 2. The posterior cruciate ligament, to the posterior most smooth area. The ligamentum patelli is attached to the upper smooth part of the II all tubercity. The lower rough area of the tubercity is subcutaneous, but is separated from the skin by the subcutaneous infrapatellar bursa. Attachments on the shoft. 1. The IILES anterior arises from the upper two-thirds of the lateral surface. 2. The upper part of the medial surface receives the insertions of the sortorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus, from before backwards. Still further posteriorly the surface gives attachment to the tibial collateral slash ligament along the medial border. 3. The soleus arises from the soleal line. The soleal line also gives attachment to the fascia covering the soleus, the fascia covering the popliteus, and the transverse facial se turn. The tendinous arch for origin of the soleus is attached to a tubercle at the upper end of the soleal line. 4. The popliteus is inserted on the posterior surface, into the triangular area above the soleal line. 5. The medial area of the posterior surface below the soleal line gives origin to the flexor digit orum longus while the lateral area gives origin to the tibial is posterior. 6. The anterior border of the tibia gives attachment to the deep fascia of the leg and, in its lower part, to the superior extensor retinaculum. 
7. The rough upper part of the fibular notch gives attachment to the interosseous tibia fibular ligament. 8. The capsular ligament of the ankle joint is attached to the lower end along the margins of articular surface. The deltoid ligament of the ankle joint is attached to the lower border of the medial malleolus. Relations of the tibia, apart from the relations mentioned above, the following may be noted. 1. The lower part of the anterior surface of the shaft, and the anterior aspect of the lower end, are crossed from medial to lateral side by the tibialis anterior, the extensor hallucis longus, the anterior tibial artery, the deep peroneal nerve, the extensor digit orum longus, and the peroneus tertius. 2. The lowermost part of the posterior surface of the shaft and the posterior aspect of the lower end are related from medial to lateral side to the tibialis posterior, which lies in a groove, the flexor digito urum longus, the posterior tibial artery, the tibial nerve, and the flexor hallucis longus. The groove for the tendon of the tibialis posterior continues downward on the posterior surface of the medial malleolus. 3. The lower one-third of the medial surface of the shaft is crossed by the great saphenous vein. Blood supply, the nutrient artery to the tibia is the largest nutrient artery in the body. It is a branch of the posterior tibial artery which enters the bone on its posterior surface at the upper end of vertical ridge. It is directed downwards. The tibia ossifies from one primary and two secondary centers. The primary center appears in the shaft during the seventh week of intrauterine life. A secondary center for the upper end appears just be birth, and fuses with the shaft at 16-18 years. The upper epiphysis is prolonged downwards to form the tibial tuber city. A secondary center for the lower end appears during the first year, forms the medial malleolus by the seventh year, and fuses with the shaft by 15-17 years. Clinical anatomy The upper end of tibia is one of the commonest sites for acute osteomyelitis. The knee joint remains safe because the capsule is attached near the articular margins of the tibia, proximal to the epiphyseal line. The tibia is commonly fractured at the junction of upper two-thirds and lower one-third of the shaft as the shaft is most slender here. Such fractures may unite slowly, or may not unite at all as the blood supply to this part of the bone is poor. This may also be caused by tearing of the nutrient artery. Forward dislocation of the tibia on the talus produces a characteristic prominence of the heel. This is the commonest type of injury of the ankle. Fibula The fibula, Latin clasp slash pin, is the lateral and smaller bone of the leg. It is very thin as compared to the tibia. It is homologous with the ulna of the upper limb. It forms a mortise of the ankle joint. Side determination, one the upper end, or head, is slightly expanded in all directions. The lower end or lateral malleolus is expanded anteroposteriorly and is flattened from side to side. The medial side of the lower end bears a triangular articular facet anteriorly, and a deep or malleolar fossa posteriorly. Features, the fibula has an upper end, a shaft, fig 2.32, and a lower end upper end or head, it is slightly expanded in all directions. The superior surface bears a circular articular facet which articulates with the lateral condyle of the tibia. The apex of the head or the styloid process projects upwards from its posterolateral aspect. The constriction immediately below the head is known as the fibula. Shoved, the shaft shows considerable variation in its form because it is molded by the muscles attached to it. It has three borders. Anterior, posterior, and interosseous, and three surfaces medial, lateral, and posterior. Borders The anterior border begins just below the anterior aspect of the head. At its lower end, it divides to enclose an elongated triangular area which is continuous with the lateral surface of the lateral malleolus. The posterior border is rounded. Its upper end lies in line with the styloid process. Below, the border is continuous with the medial margin of the groove on the back of the lateral malleolus. The medial border lies just medial to the anterior border, but on a more posterior plane. It terminates below at the upper end of a roughened area above the tailor facet of the lateral malleolus. In its upper two-thirds, the interosseous border lies very close to the anterior border and may be indistinguishable from it. 
surface, the medial surface lies between the anterior and interosseous borders. In its upper two-thirds, it is very narrow, measuring one millimeter or less. The lateral surface lies between the anterior and posterior borders. It is twisted backwards in its lower part. The posterior surface is the largest of the three surfaces. It lies between the interosseous and posterior borders. In its upper two-thirds, it is divided into two parts by a vertical ridge called the medial crest. Lower end or lateral malleolus, the tip of the lateral malleolus is 0.5 cm lower than that of the medial malleolus, and its anterior surface is 1.5 cm posterior to that of the medial malleolus. It has the following four surfaces. 1. The anterior surface is rough and rounded. 2. The posterior surface is marked by a groove. 3. The lateral surface is subcutaneous. 1. 4. The medial surface bears a triangular articular facet for the talus anteriorly and the malleolar fossa posteriorly. Attachments and relations of the fibula. 1. The medial surface of the shaft gives origin to, the extensor digit orum longus, from the whole of the upper one-fourth, and from the anterior half of the middle two-fourths. The extensor hallucis longus, from the posterior half of its middle two-fourths. The peroneus tertius, from its lower one-fourth. 2. The part of the posterior surface between the medial crest and the interosseous border, the grooved part, gives origin to the tibialis posterior. 3. The part of the posterior surface between the medial crest and the posterior border gives origin to a soleus form the upper one-fourth two floxer hallucis longus form it s lower three-fourth. 3. The lateral surface of the shaft give origin to, peroneus longus, ul, from its upper one-third, and posterior half of the middle one-third. The peroneus brevis, pb, from the anterior half of its middle one-third, and the whole of lower one-third. The common peroneal nerve terminates in relation to the neck of fibula the head of the fibula receives the insertion of the biceps femoris on anterolateral slope of the apex. This insertion is C-shaped. The tibular collateral ligament of the knee joint is attached within the C-shaped area. The origins of the extensor digit orum, the peroneus longus, and the soleus, described above, extend onto the corresponding aspects of the head. For the capsular ligament of the superior tibia fibular goant is attached around the, the articular face the anterior border of fibula gives attachment to, anterior intermuscular septum of the leg. Superior extensor retinaculum, to lower part of the anterior margin of triangular area. Superior peroneal retinaculum, to the lower part of the posterior margin of triangular area. 5. The posterior border give attachment to the posterior intermuscular septum. The interosseous border gives attachment to the interosseous membrane. The attachment leaves a gap at the upper end for passage of the posterior tibial vessels. 10. The triangular area above the medial surface of the lateral malleolus gives attachment to the interosseous tibia fibular ligament in the middle. The joint between lower ends of tibia and fibula is called serodesmosis. The anterior tibia fibular ligament, anteriorly. The posterior tibia fibular, posteriorly. The attachments on the lateral malleolus are as follows, anterior talofibular ligament to the anterior surface. Inferior transverse tibia fibular, a part of posterior tibia fibular, ligament above and posterior talofibular ligament below to the malleolar fossa. The capsule of the ankle joint along the edges of the malleolar articular surface. Slight notch on the lower border give attachment to calcanofibular ligament. The groove on the posterior surface of the malleolus lodges the tendon of the peroneus rearus, which is deep, and of the peroneus longus, which is superficial. Blood supply. The peroneal artery gives off the nutrient artery for the fibula, which enters the bone on its posterior surface. The nutrient foramen is directed downwards. The fibula ossifies from one primary and two secondary centers. The primary center for the shaft appears during the eighth week of intrauterine life. A secondary center for the lower end appears during the first year, and fuses with the shaft by about 16 years. A secondary center for the upper end appears during the fourth year, and fuses with the shaft by about 18 years.
the fibula violates the law of ossification because the secondary center which appears first in the lower end does not fuse last. The reasons for this violation are, the secondary center appears first in the lower end because it is a pressure epiphysis, law states that pressure epiphysis appear before the traction epiphysis. The upper epiphysis fuses last because this is the growing end of the bone. It continues to grow afterwards along with the upper end of tibia which is a growing end. Sometimes a surgeon takes a piece of bone from the part of the body and uses it to repair a defect in some other. This procedure is called a home grow. For this purpose pieces of bone are easily obtained from the subcutaneous medial aspect of tibia and shaft of fibula. If the foot gets caught in a hole in the ground, there is forcible abduction and external rotation. In such an injury, first there occurs a spiral fracture of lateral malleolus, then fracture of the medial malleolus. Finally the posterior margin of the lower end of tibia shears off. These stages are termed first, second, and third degrees of Potts fracture. The upper and lower ends of the fibula are subcutaneous and palpable. The common peroneal nerve can be rolled against the neck of fibula. This nerve is commonly abjured here, resulting in foot drop. Fibula is an ideal spare bone for a bone grid. Though fibula does not bear any weight, the lateral malleolus and the ligaments attached to it are very important in maintaining stability at the ankle joint. Bones of the foot tarsus slash tarsals, the tarsus is made up of seven tarsal bones, arranged in two rows. In the proximal row, there is the talus above, and the calcaneus below. In the distal row, there are four tarsal bones lying side by side. From medial to lateral side these are the medial cuneiform, the intermediate cuneiform, the lateral cuneiform and the cuboid. Another bone, the navicular, is interposed between the talus and the three cuneiform, Latin wedge bones. In other words, it is interposed between the proximal and distal rows. The tarsal bones are much larger and stronger than the carpal bones because they have to support and distribute the body weight. Each tarsal bone is roughly cobwadal in snape having six surfaces, talus, the talus, Latin ankle, is the second largest tarsal bone. It lies between the tibia above and the calcaneum below, gripped on the sides by the two malleoli. It has a head neck and a body. Side determination, one the rounded head is directed forwards. 1. The trochlear articular surface O1. Oh, the body is directed upwards, and the concave articular surface downwards. 2. The body bears a large triangular facet laterally, and a comma shaped facet medially. Head, L. It is directed forwards and slightly downwards and medially. 2. Its anterior surface is oval and convex. The long axis of this surface is directed downwards and medially. It articulates with the posterior surface of the navicular bone. 3. The inferior surface is marked by three articular areas separated by indistinct ridges. The posterior facet is largest, oval, and gently convex. It articulates with the middle facet on sustentaculum tali of the calcaneum. The anterolateral facet articulates with the anterior facet of the calcaneum, and the medial facet with the spring ligament. Neck. 1. This is the constricted part of the bone between the head and the body. 2. It is set obliquely on the body, so that inferiorly it extends further backwards on the medial side than on the lateral side. However, when viewed from dorsal side, the long axis of the neck is directed downwards, forwards, and medially. The neck body angle is 130 to 140 degrees in infants and 150 degrees body, the body is cuboidal in shape and has five surface, the superior surface bears an articular surface, which articulates with the lower end of the tibia to form the ankle joint. This surface is also called the trochlear surface. It is convex from before backwards and concave from side to side. It is wider anteriorly than posteriorly. The medial border of the surface is straight, but the lateral border is directed forwards and laterally. The trochlear surface articulates with the inferior surface of lower end of tibia. The interior surface bears an oval, concave articular surface which articulates with the posterior facet of the calcaneum to form the subtalar joint. The medial surface is articular above and non-articular below. 
the articular surface is comma-shaped and articulates with the medial malleolus of tibia. The lateral surface bears a triangular articular surface for the lateral malleolus. The surface is concave from above downwards, and its apex forms the lateral tubercle of the talus. The posterior part of the lateral surface is separated from the trochlea by an ill-defined, small triangular area which articulates with the inferior dot transverse tibia fibular ligament. The posterior process is small and is marked by an oblique groove. The groove is bounded by medial and lateral tubercles. The lateral tubercle is occasionally separate and is then called the OS trigonum. Attachments on the talus, the talus is devoid of muscular attachments, but numerous ligaments are attached to it because it takes part in three joints, e.g. ankle, talocalcanian and talonavicular, the following ligament are attached to the neck. 1. The following ligaments are attached to the neck. The distal part of the dorsal surface provides attachment to the capsular ligament of the ankle. The proximal part of the dorsal surface lies within the ankle joint. The inferior surface provides attachment to the anitoroceous talocalcanian and cervical ligaments. The lateral part of the neck provides attachment to the anterior talofibular ligament. 2. The lower, Non-articular part of the medial surface of the body gives attachment to the deep fibers of the deltoid or anterior tibiotalar ligament. 3. The groove on the posterior process lodges the tendon of the flexor holluxes longus. The medial tubercle provides attachment to the superficial fibers of the deltoid ligament, posterior tibiotalar, above and the medial talocalcanian ligament below. Posterior talofibular ligament is attached to upper part of posterior process while posterior talocalcanian ligament is attached to its plantar border. The talus ossifies from one center which appears during the sixth month of intrauterine life. Forced dorsiflexion may cause fracture of the neck of the talus. Two arteries to body of talus go through the neck only as occurs in some cases, the body would get obviscular necrosis in fracture of its neck. Calcaneus or calcanium, the calcaneus, Latin heel, is the largest tarsal bone. It forms the prominence of the heel. Its long axis is directed forwards, upwards, and laterally. It is roughly cuboidal and has six surfaces. Side determination, one the anterior surface is small and bears a concavo convex articular facet for the cuboid. The posterior surface is large and rough. 2. The dorsal or upper surface bears a large convex articular surface in the middle. The plantar surface is rough and triangular. 3. The lateral surface is flat and the medial surface concave from above downwards. Features, the anterior surface is the smallest surface of the bone. It is covered by a concavo convex, sloping articular surface for the cuboid. The posterior surface is divided into three areas, upper, middle and lower. The upper area is smooth while the others are rough. The dorsal or superior surface can be divided into three areas. The posterior one-third is rough. The middle one-third is covered by the posterior facet for articulation with the facet on inferior surface of body of talus. This facet is oval, convex, and oblique. The anterior one-third is articular in the anteromedial part, and non-articular in its posterolateral part. The articular part is in the form of an elongated middle facet present on the sustentaculum tali and anterior facet. These two facets articulate respectively with posterior facet and anteromedial facets on inferior aspect of head of talus. The plantar surface is rough and marked by three tubercles. The medial and lateral tubercles are situated posteriorly, whereas the anterior tubercle lies in the anterior part. The lateral surface is rough and almost flat. It presents in its anterior part, a small elevation termed the peroneal trochlea or tubercle. The medial surface is concave from above downwards. The concavity is accentuated by the presence of a shelf-like projection of bone, which projects medially from its anterosuperior border. The upper surface of this process assists in the formation of the talocalcanian avicular joint. Its lower surface is grooved, and the medial margin is in the form of a rough strip convex from before backwards. Attachments and relations of the calcaneus, one the middle rough area on the posterior surface receives the insertion of the tendocalcaneus and of the plantaris. 
the upper area is covered by a bursa. The lower area is covered by dense fibro fatty tissue and supports the body weight while standing. It can be compared to the attachment of ligamentum patelli. To the lateral part of the non-articular area on the anterior part of the dorsal surface provides, three origin to the extensor digit orum brevis. Attachment to the stem of the inferior extensor retinaculum. Attachment to the stem of the bifurcate ligament. The medial, narrow part of the non-articular area forms the sulcus calcanei, and provides attachment to the interosseous talocalcanean ligament medially and the cervical ligament laterally. For plantar surface, the medial tubercle, A origin for tray abductor hallucis medially. B attachment to the flexor retinaculum medially. C origin to the flexor digit orum. D origin to THR flexor brevis anteriorly. E attachment to the plantar aponeurosis anteriorly. The lateral tubercle gives origin to the abductor digitima EEMI, the origin extending to the front of the tubercle. The anterior tubercle and the rough area in front of it provide attachment to the short plantar ligament. The rough strip between the three tubercles affords attachment to the long plantar ligament. The attachments and relations of the lateral surface are as follows. The peroneal tubercle lies between the tendons of the peroneus brevis above and the peroneus iongus below. The trochlea itself gives attachment to a slip from the inferior peroneal retinaculum. The calcanofibular ligament is attached about 1 cm behind the peroneal trochlea. 5. The attachments and relations of the medial surface are as follows. The groove on the lower surface of the sustentaculum tali is occupied by the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. The medial margin of the sustentaculum tali is related to the tendon of the flexor digit orum longus and provides attachment to the spring ligament anteriorly. A slip from the fialis posterior in the middle. Some of the superficial fibers of the deltoid ligament along the whole length. The medial talocalcanean ligament posteriorly. Below the groove for the flexor hallucis longus, the medial surface gives origin to the fleshy fibers of the medial head of the flexor digit orum accessorius. Ossification The calcaneus ossifies from one primary and one secondary centers. The primary center appears during the third month of intrauterine life. The secondary center appears between six and eight years to form a scale-like epiphysis on the posterior surface, which fuses with the rest of the bone by 14-16 years. CNCA ana OMY fracture of the calcaneum results by a fall from a height. Sustentaculum tali may get fractured in forced inversion of the foot. Calcaneum may develop a spur, which is painful. Navicular bone, the navicular bone is boat-shaped. It is situated on the medial side of the foot, in front of the head of the talus, and behind the three cuneiform bones. Features, the anterior surface is convex is divided in three facets for the cuneiform bones. 1. The posterior surface is concave and oval for articulation with the head of the talus. 2. The dorsal surface is broad and convex from side to side. It is rough for the attachment of ligaments. 3. The plantar surface is small and slightly concave from side to side. It is rough and non-articular. 4. The medial surface has a blunt and prominent tubercity, directed downwards, the tubercity is separated from the plantar surface by a groove. 5. The lateral surface is rough and irregular, but frequently has a facet for the cuboid. Attachments, L. Tubercity of the navicular bone receives the principal insertion of the tibialis posterior. The groove below the tubercity transmits a part of the tendon of this muscle to other bones. 2. Plantar surface provides attachment to the spring ligament or plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. 3. Calcaneonavicular part of the bifurcate ligament is attached to the lateral surface. To the dorsal surface are attached the talonavicular, cuneonavicular, and cubonavicular ligaments. It ossifies from one center which appears during the third year of life. Cuneiform bones, common features, 1. There are three cuneiform bones, medial, intermediate and lateral. The medial cuneiform is the largest and the intermediate cuneiform, the smallest. 2. As their name suggests, these are wedge-shaped bones. In the medial cuneiform, the edge of the wedge forms the dorsal surface. 
In the intermediate and lateral cuneiforms, the thin edge of wedge forms the plantar surface. 3. The anterior parts of the medial and lateral cuneiforms project further forwards than the intermediate cuneiform. This forms a deep recess for the base of second metatarsal bone. Medial cuneiform, pheogures, one dorsal surface is formed by the rough edge of the wedge. Two plantar surface is formed by the base of the wedge. Three distal surface has a large kidney-shaped facet for the base of the first metatarsal bone, with its hilum directed laterally. Four proximal surface is a pyriform facet for the navicular. Five medial surface is rough and subcutaneous. Six lateral surface is marked by an inverted L-shaped facet along the posterior and superior margins for the intermediate cuneiform bone. The anterosuperior part of the facet is separated by a vertical ridge. This part is for the base of second metatarsal bone. The anteroinferior part of the lateral surface is roughened. Atokments, one the greater part of the tibialis anterior is inserted into an impression on the anteroinferior angle of the medial surface. 2. The plantar surface receives a slip from the tibialis posterior. 3. A part of the peroneus longus is inserted into the rough anteroinferior part of the lateral surface. Intermediate cuneiform, Fiatur's L. The proximal and distal surfaces bear triangular articular facets. 2. The lateral surface is marked by a vertical facet along its posterior margin. This facet is for the lateral cuneiform bone. It is indented in the middle. 3. The plantar surface is formed by the edge of the wedge. Atokments. The plantar surface receives a slip from the tibialis posterior. Lateral cuneiform. Fiatures, L. The proximal surface is rough in its lower one-third, and has a triangular facet in its upper two-thirds for the navicular bone. 2. The lateral surface is marked in its posterosuperior part by a triangular or oval facet for the cuboid. 3. The plantar surface is formed by the edge of the wedge. Atokments, the plantar surface receives a slip from the tibialis posterior. Ossification Each cuneiform bone ossifies from one center, which appears during the first year in the lateral cuneiform, during the second year in the medial cuneiform, and during the third year in the intermediate cuneiform bone. Cuboid The cuboid is the lateral bone of the distal row of the tarsus, situated in front of the calcaneum and behind the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones. It has six surfaces. Fiatures, one the proximal surface is concavo-convex for articulation with the calcaneum. Two the distal surface is also articular. It is divided by a vertical ridge into two areas for the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones. Three the dorsal surface is rough for the attachment of ligaments. It is directed upwards and laterally. 4. The plantar surface is crossed anteriorly by an oblique groove. The groove is 5 5 bounded posteriorly by a prominent ridge. 6 5. The lateral surface is shot and notched. 7. The medial surface is extensive, being partly articular and partly non articular. An oval facet in the middle articulates with the lateral cuneiform bone. Proximal to this, a small facet may present for the navicular bone. Atokments, 1. The notch on the lateral surface, and the groove on the plantar surface, are occupied by the tendon of the peroneus I and BS. 2. The ridge posterior to the groove gives attachment to the deep fibers of the long plantar ligament. 3. The short plantar ligament is attached to the posterior border of the plantar surface. 4. The posteromedial part of the plantar surface provides, a insertion to a slip from the tibialis posterior. B. Origin to the Floxer hallucis brevis. 5. The non-articular part of the medial surface provides attachment to ligaments, incultiting the lateral fiend of the bifurcate ligament. The cuboid bone ossifies from one center which appears just before birth. Metatarsus, 1. The metatarsus is made up of five metatarsal bones, which are numbered from medial to lateral side. 2. Each metatarsal is a miniature long bone and has the following parts. The shaft which is slightly convex dorsally and concave ventrally in its longitudinal axis. It is prismoid in form, and tapers from base to the head. The hose or proximal end is set obliquely in such a way that it projects backwards and laterally. The head or distal end is flattened from side to side. Metacarpals versus metatarsals, 
the metatarsals are quite similar to metacarpals. The differences between the metacarpals and metatarsals shown in Table 2.1. Identification, the first metatarsals, one this is the shortest, thickest, and stoutest of all metatarsal bones and is adapted for transmission of the body weight. Two the proximal surface of the base has a kidney-shaped facet, which is concave outwards. Second metatarsals, one this is the longest metatarsal. It has a wedge-shaped base. Two the lateral side of the base has two articular facets, a larger dorsal, and a smaller plantar each of which is subdivided into a proximal part for the lateral cuneiform bone and a distal part for the third metatarsal. Three the medial side of the base bears one facet, placed dorsally, for the medial cuneiform. The third metatarsal, one the lateral side of the base has one facet, placed dorsally, for the fourth metatarsal bone. Two the medial side of the base has two facets, dorsal and plantar for second metatarsal bone. Fourth metatarsal, the proximal surface of the base is quadrangular. It articulates with the cuboid bone. Two the lateral side of the base has one facet, placed dorsally, for the fifth metatarsal bone. Three the medial side of the base has one facet placed dorsally, which is subdivided into a proximal part for the lateral cuneiform and a distal part, for third metatarsal bone. Two the fifth metatarsal bone. L. The lateral side of the base has a large tubercity or styloid process projecting backwards and laterally. 2. The medial side of the base has one facet for the fourth metatarsal bone. 3. The plantar surface of the base is grooved by the tendon of the abductor digiti minimi. Important attachments to metatarsal bones 1. A part of the tibialis anterior is inserted on the medial side of the base of the first metatarsal bone. 2. The greater part of the peroneus longus is inserted on a large impression at the inferior angle of the lateral surface of the base of the first metatarsal bone. 3. The peroneus brevis is inserted on the dorsal surface of the tubercity of the fifth metatarsal bone. 4. The peroneus tertius is inserted on the medial part of the dorsal surface of the base and the medial border of the shaft of the fifth metatarsal bone. 5. The flexor digitima inimi brevis arises from the plantar surface of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. Point 6. The shafts of metatarsal bones give origin to int erosi. Each metatarsal bone ossifies from one primary and one secondary center. The primary center appears in the shaft during the tenth week of fetal life in the first metatarsal, and during the ninth week of fetal life in the rest of the metatarsals. A secondary center appears for the base of the first metatarsal during the third year, and for the heads of the other metatarsals between three and four years. All secondary centers unite with the shaft by 18th year. A separate center for the tubercity of the fifth metatarsal bone may be present. Phalanges, there are 14 phalanges in each foot, two for the great toe and three for each of the other toes. As compared to the phalanges of the hand, these are much smaller in size, and the shafts particularly of first row are compressed from side to side. Otherwise their arrangement and features are similar in two limbs. Attachments, one on the base of distal phalanges. Lateral four toes, flexor digiforfum longus on the plantar surface, and the extensor expansion on the dorsal surface. Great toe, flexor hallucis longus on the plantar surface, and the extensor hallucis longus on the dorsal surface. 2. On shaft and bases of middle phalanges a flexor digit orum rearis on each side of the shaft on plantar surface, and extensor expansion on the dorsal surface. 2. On the base of phalanges. 2nd, 3rd, and 4th toes, a lumbrical muscle on the medial side, and an interosseous muscle on each side. 5th toe, a plantar interosseous muscle on the medial side, and the abductor digiate miami and the flexor digiti minimi brevis on the lateral side. Great toe, abductor hallucis, and part of the flexor hallucis medially, adductor hallucis and the remaining part of the flexor hallucis brevis laterally. One the throws flexor she oiled is attached to the margins of the proximal and middle phalanges of the lateral four toes. Ossification. Phalanx ossifies by one primary center for the shaft which appears in tenth week of fetal life. The single secondary center appears in the base. It appears in the proximal phalanx in second year, middle phalanx in third year and in distal phalanx in the sixth year. 
these fuse with the respective shafts by 18th year. The big toe has two phalanges and their secondary centers appear in second and third years to fuse with shaft in 18th year. Adventitious bursae develop due to excessive or abnormal friction, e.g. bursa over tendocal caneus due to ill-fitting shoes. Bunyan is an adventitious bursa on the medial suit of the head of first metatarsal bone. Fracture of tuberosity of fifth metatarsal bone occur due to the pull of peroneus bravus muscle. Fracture of second, third, fourth, or fifth metatarsal bones is common in soldiers and policemen and is called march fracture. Sesamoid bones, the sesamoid, sigium, seed like, bones are located at the following sites. 1. The patella is, by far, the largest sesamoid bone. 2. There is one sesamoid bone, os perineum, in the tendon of peroneus longus. It articulates with the cuboid. 3. Sesamoid bones may be present in the tendons of the tibialis anterior, the tibialis posterior, the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, fabella, the tendon of adductor longus, rider's bone, and the gluteus maximus. 4. There are two small sesamoids in the tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis. They articulate with the head of the first metatarsal bone. 5. Other tendons crossing the metatarsal, phalangeal, and interphalangeal joints may have sesamoids. Attachments on linea aspira from lateral to medial side. Vastus intermedius vastus lateralis. Short head of biceps femoris adductor magnus. Adductor brevis. Adductor longus and pectineus vastus medialis. Iliac crest of lower limb is used for bone marrow biopsy. Femur is the longest and strongest bone. Fibula is mostly used for bone graft. Talus bone has no muscle attachment. First metatarsal has two sesamoid bones on the plantar surface of its head. A player was kicked hard on the lateral surface of right knee during a hockey game.